Hi, it's Laura at Aquamarine18. Thank you for stopping by my channel. I am here with a book review today, an in-depth review of the book Tarot for Troubled Times by Shaheen Miro and Teresa Reed. And I had mentioned that I had read this book in a recent um, reading updates video and there seemed to be quite a bit of interest in a detailed review of this book, so I thought that I would compile my thoughts um, into a video. So if you're interested, here's that video. Um, so I bought this book myself. I always think it's important to mention that when you're reviewing something, you know, so um, I bought this book myself um, and it had been sitting on my desk for a little while as a um, to read a book that I wanted to read um, and I finally got around to it fairly recently, made lots of notes. If I'm looking off um, off camera, it's because I have a lot of notes. Um, so overall, I mean, there's a lot of things that I did like about this book. I have definitely some criticisms. Um, of this book and things that I didn't love about this book um, and some things that I didn't love but I think are not necessarily shortcomings of the book so much as they are maybe th points where the book didn't quite do what I thought it was going to do or maybe where I just wasn't the intended audience. So, you know, I have lots of thoughts. Um, in terms of organizing this review, what I thought I would do is first talk a little bit about who I think this book is perhaps oriented towards, who might be the most interested in this book. Um, then I will talk about the kind of form and formatting of the book, the, the style, um, organization, things like that. I want to spend some time talking about the concept of shadow as it is deployed in this book, since um, one of the, um, I guess it's a subtitle really, uh, of the book is Confront Your Shadow, Heal Yourself, and Transform the World. So I want to talk about how the authors talk about shadow, because I understand shadow quite differently. Uh, so think a little bit about what that uh, means. Then I want to talk about the politics of the book. I want to talk about what exactly Troubled Times refers to and some of the content in the book around um, activism. Since the book um, talks about healing yourself and transforming the world, the authors are making connections between kind of self-development work, uh, working with tarot and other modalities of self-development, and self-care and self-growth and connecting that to creating change in the world. So I want to think about the politics of that. I want to discuss a little bit um, the activities and prompts that are provided in the books, like journaling prompts and spreads and things like this. And then I'll just share some concluding thoughts. And I thought what I would do in terms of the organization of this review is to timestamp those topics in the description box as well. So if you want to skip my um, talking about about a lot of it and just skip to what I think about the activities for example then you can you can do that I want this review to be useful for folks so um, I'm just going to be talking about some of the things that I found um, most interesting whether kind of things that I like the most about the book things that um, bothered me the most about the book frankly um, things that stuck out to me the most by no means can I you know exhaustively address every single thing you know in there um, but this is just informed by kind of my thoughts. If there's something you particularly want to know my thoughts on that I don't mention, you know, there's a comment box, feel free to ask. Um, you know, these are just my thoughts on what I thought might be of most interest to the folks that I engage with on YouTube anyway. So I hope that this is helpful. So to begin with, um, who do I think is the audience for this book? Um, I mentioned that the book is oriented towards uh, this idea of confront your shadow, heal yourself, transform the world. So I will say that this book is very much for someone who is interested in working with tarot for themselves, doing readings for themselves, working with tarot as a um, companion to journaling, working with tarot as a companion to intention setting, other kinds of um, activities like this. This is not a tarot book for learning to read tarot for other people. I think that this is fairly um, obvious from the, the description on the back of the book, um, but you know, just in case it's not, um, this is not a book that's gonna teach you how to read the cards for other people, um, but it is gonna give you lots of activities to work with the cards on your own. I would say in terms of the tarot content of this book, um, that this would not, in my opinion, uh, be an ideal, first tarot book for someone um, who just wants to learn tarot for the first time, at least not on its own. 
Um, it's, I would say that it is reasonably beginner friendly. Several of the spreads are um, very small, you know, like two card, three card um, spreads that are, that are quite approachable. Um, it's not using a bunch of tarot terminology that's going to be unfamiliar. So it's not, it's not inaccessible, but I wouldn't say that it's a first, um, you know, a first learn to read tarot book. Um, but I also don't think it's marketed as one. So that, like, and again, is no way a criticism, just who I think the book is for. I will say the content on activism and the, the transform the world component of the, of the subtitle of the book is extremely, extremely 101 level, like very, very, very beginner. If you are just beginning to think about ways that self-development work might inform or intersect with working for change in broader society. You know, it, it has, I think, some good ideas and good places to start. But if you are a, you know, seasoned activist or someone who's a community organizer who's been doing this kind of work for um, a long time, it's going to read very, very, very 101 level for you. Um, and in that sense, I think that honestly, like I was not the intended audience um, for that component of the book. But that's not to say there is not, you know, lots of readership that fall into that category. Um, so again, very, very 101, very basic in terms of activism, but less 101 and not so beginner in terms of the tarot content. So that's who I think that the book might be for. Um, and again, someone who's interested in reading the cards for themselves uh, primarily and doing self-development and self-growth and processing kind of work. So the form of the book, the technical, what I call in the timestamp, the form, the technical stuff. Um, the book is... 270 pages long total. Um, it uses a nice, reasonably sized sans serif font. Um, I will say, though it's 270 pages, it is actually shorter than that makes it sound because there are a fair amount of pages, for example, that look like this. So in terms of reading cover to cover, it's actually not all that long of a book. Um, and I would say that the focus on tarot doesn't really start until around page 79. So the authors did include a really good, thorough, excellent table of contents that gives good details about what to expect in each section um, of the book. But it's not until the fourth chapter introducing the archetypes, which starts on page 79 out of 270, that I would say that the book actually becomes a book about tarot. Before that, it's talking about shadow. It's talking about um, kind of healing and processing in very general kinds of ways. Um, you know, grounding. It's not really a tarot book until page 79 is my thought. Um, so I mentioned that I like the table of contents, really thorough, really great. Something that I really like um, that the authors, um, Shaheen Miro and Teresa Reed, do in this book that a lot of co-authors don't do is that they really distinguish which of the two of them is talking or writing a lot of the time. So they will mention, you know, Teresa grew up, you know, involved with this or Shaheen likes to do this. Um, so you do get a sense of the co-authors as distinct people slash personalities, which is really nice. I, I find that sometimes in a co-authored text, you know, thinking as both a reader and as a, as a person who sometimes writes with other people, it's easy to fall into kind of sounding like a homogenous blob of a person that's kind of a amalgam of the two, and they don't, which I really like uh, stylistically, I will say. Something that they include that I also appreciate is a list of resources at the back. Um, so they have a list of tarot books at the back with quite uh, a lot of books on the list. They have a list of tarot decks at the back with, again, quite a lot, some indie, some mass market, um, a reasonable variety there. They include a section on books on magic and more. They include a section of books on activism. And they include a section of where to go for help. So here they've got things like um, crisis lines, which I think is really good, and particularly in a book like this, um, that is going to deal with, you know, pro processing difficult feelings, or that's going to talk about 
oppression, it's going to talk about trauma. I think having those resources at the back is really a good inclusion. So I'm appreciative of that. Uh, something that they do not include that I really wish that they did are citations. <laughs> Um, because a resource list like this of tarot books, while great, um, is not the same thing as a bibliography. Um, and there are ideas in here that should be cited, to be quite frank, um, in my view. I think that citations are really useful because when you're reading, you know, not only does it give credit where credit's due and show the, the research and the work that the authors have done, but it also, as a reader, it helps you follow up on particular ideas that you're interested in, right? So if particular books are footnoted in a particular section or another author is quoted or something like that, you can go um, and, and find that um, find that reference for yourself. So I do wish that there were citations in a bibliography. I will say though that I want every book to have citations in a bibliography, you know, unless it's a novel maybe, but generally I really want to see citations in a bibliography. I recognize that not all publishers um, you know, r require it or even want it, uh, but I do think a citation in bibliography is important. Now, I want to talk a little bit about shadow in this book. Since shadow is mentioned on the cover, and I think that, you know, the idea of shadow or shadow work is so much a concept that I think is, is known to folks who are in the tarot community, who are interested in tarot, that is mentioned a lot. Um, that's a bit of a buzzword that may be, um, you know, the term shadow is something that someone would see on this book that might um, stoke their interest in it, right? Uh, or make them interested in this book. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So the book provides a definition of shadow on page 11. So it's like right near the beginning. And I'm not going to read the whole entire page, um, but to just say a little bit about what the authors mean when they refer to shadow. They write, quote, the shadow is that space within and around you where you feel abandoned, lost, and confused. It is that space where you feel completely out of control, poked and prodded by chaos and fear. Okay. So then a little bit down the page, they continue on, quote, Deep inside every one of our psyches is this dark, murky spot. This is a place where we'd rather not tread. Instead, we prefer to shut the door, ignore it, and put our attention to love and light or whatever other pleasantries we'd rather present as ourselves. Psychologist Carl Jung called this the shadow, the part of ourselves that we don't like to face, so we tend to avoid or hide it in some way. On the outside, we look fine, but on the inside, we're consumed by thoughts such as fear, jealousy, anger, perfectionism, or worse. We bury the ugly parts of ourselves when in reality, the shadow longs to be acknowledged." End quote. Okay, so I think that this is going to be a fairly um, you know, familiar definition of shadow in terms of how it is um, often utilized in the context of discussions around shadow work in the tarot community, at least as I've seen it. However, I do want to say that this is not how I understand shadow in the work of Carl Jung. Um, and I think that this is a fair thing to bring up in the context of this review since the authors have invoked Jung, right, by name. So I think that it's worth mentioning um, that I don't actually think that this is um, shadow in the context of Jung. And I'm going to link below uh, Natalia, the channel Ouroboros, who has a video specifically explaining, um, with reference to Jung, what the shadow is. And Natalia is a clinical psychologist, um, so comes from a perspective of, of a clinician of a mental health professional, right? Which, which I am not. Um, my knowledge of thinkers like Jung um, and other psychoanalytic thinkers like Freud or Lacan, for example, comes from a background in the humanities and cultural theory. Um, so is maybe like less relevant to the context of this discussion, to be honest. Um, but in this video, Natalia explains uh, shadow in the context of Jung's work. And in her description box of her video, thank you, Natalia, for including these. She has some quotes that I think are worth uh, mentioning here. 
Um, so she includes a quote from Jung, which says, um, describes the shadow as hidden or unconscious aspects of oneself, both good and bad, which the ego has either repressed or never recognized. Right? So that's Jung. And we see in Jung's quote there that the shadow is hidden or unconscious aspects, both good and bad. Right? So elements of one's shadow are not inherently negative things. Right? The shadow is not just things we don't like about ourselves. Right? Things we don't like about ourselves are, are important to think about right? and are important to think about critically and are important to um, explore. But if we don't like something about our, ourselves, like that means we're conscious of it. That means that we know it's there, right? Maybe we think that we're a little bit too competitive and sometimes that's a bad thing. Or, or maybe we, um, we know that we can be jealous in ways that are not the best, right? Th those are things that we're aware of. <laughs> so they're not shadow in the sense of Jung's uh, description of it. And Natalia also includes a quote by Daryl Sharp, who's writing about Jung's work. And Sharp writes, quote, The shadow is not, however, only the dark underside of the personality. It also consists of instincts, abilities, and positive moral qualities that have long been buried or never been conscious, end quote. So again, not just negative things. And this is a bit, I, I found Natalia's video looking for something that talked about this because it's a bit of a, of a pet peeve of mine, um, to be honest, when it's talked about this way, with reference to Jung anyway. Obviously, folks can define words and talk about words in all different kind of ways. But um, when we're talking about Jung, the shadow is not, strictly speaking, negative, right? But what we have in the book is that approach which again is a way of talking about the shadow that I see very, very often. So for example, in the book um, for one section where they're giving some meanings of the cards and some affirmations, they give positive keywords for a card and shadow, right? So they're making positive and shadow into opposites, right? Which suggests shadow is inherently negative, which in Jung, it's not. Um, it, the traits therein are not necessarily negative, right? So I think this is all to say that the book is talking about confronting a lot of things that are important, um, confronting difficult emotions, confronting difficult experiences, confronting, um, you know, difficulties in relationships we might have, all kinds of um, important work, important self-development work, um, as well as kind of more outward looking, thinking about ways to contribute in the world in a good way, right? Um, definitely doing something important and valid, not doing Jungian shadow, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, <laughs> so moving on from that um, little ramble there, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the, the politics of uh, Tarot for Troubled Times because with a phrase like change the world on the book, right, it, it is indicative of a definite kind of activist bent to the book. So there's going to be a politics. I think this is great. Um, so immediately I'm wondering, you know, when I pick up a book like this, well, what what is troubled times, right? What is the things about the world that we're going to be talking about confronting, talking about challenging, talking about, dare I say, dismantling <laughs> aspects of the status quo that are really problematic, right? And also sometimes in the book, this is like a little bit nebulous. You know, there'll be phrases like, you know, we need to be a force for good in the world. We need to fight against you know, negative things in the world or fight against ignorance or fight against, you know, bad actions of, of various sorts. And this is, this is like rather vague, but the authors do name, you know, specific forms of oppression. They talk about misogyny and patriarchy and racism. They talk about environmental crisis, right? And I think that the fact that they name those things is really important. Um, I wish that it was more explicit f closer to the beginning of the book because at first reading it, I'm a bit like, okay, if by troubled times you mean 
systemic oppression, rising tides of xenophobia and climate crisis, like just say that, <laughs> you know, I really want you to say that. And they do say that just like not quite soon enough for me, um, but that's OK. Um, I appreciate their their naming those things. I think that that's really important. Um, so definitely good, um, good there. I will say I struggled with um, the fact that amidst talking critically about, for example, misogyny and patriarchy and heteronormativity and homophobia, their descriptions of the cards, um, particularly when they're des describing the cards as archetypes, is very gender normative, is very, very strongly gendered. So, for example, um, on page 84, they refer to the empress as, a, again, a female archetype, a nurturer and protector of the young, you know, using the language of fertility, and matriarchy, or rather like matriarchalism, um, motherliness, also sensuous and enjoys pleasure, with a, with a shadow side, and again, here it means negative side, as smothering and neediness, think of the overbearing helicopter mom, you know. So very, in my experience and feeling, very like gender normative, um, gender stereotypical ways of thinking about archetypes. I appreciate that many people work with gendered archetypes, um, divine masculine, divine feminine, and things like that. Um, and in no way am I suggesting that like nobody should do that or, or anything like that. I don't personally, um, you know, but, but folks find, find meaning in, in those things and that's, that's fine. Um, but I do think that at times these kind of descriptions can veer into gender stereotypes. And I think that gender stereotypes are a problem um, and are a barrier for me. Like reading a book like this are a barrier for me, for sure. I will also mention that there are some, um, not, not many, um, but there are some points where I think that there are some issues um, in the book in terms of cultural appropriation. So particularly uh, mentioning smudging in, in a generic kind of a way. Um, when the language of smudging has been you know, problematized as, as being appropriated um, from specific indigenous nations for whom it is a practice with very particular protocols, for example. And also one um, new moon ritual in the book that completely out of nowhere um, brings in Yemaya um, with no context whatsoever other than referring to Yemaya as quote from page 253, the Yoruba mother goddess, end quote, um, which again is very, very out of nowhere. Um, I am not an expert on this, but I understand referring to Orishas as um, goddesses to be not accurate and potentially troublesome. Um, so I'm going to actually link um, below a video to a channel who I subscribe to, Shamanic Iraq Priestess, um, and she has a video um, talking about Orishas not being goddesses, right? And the some of the some of the problems of, of taking kind of culturally specific language to refer to something else outside of that that paradigm in a kind of um, way to suggest that they're just kind of the same thing, uh, which which they're not. So I think that that's worth mentioning as well. In terms of um, continuing the conversation about the politics in this book, they I ap really appreciate that they talk about um, privilege, they name privilege, they define privilege, they, I think, present it in a way that is going to be really comprehensible, again, for someone who maybe hasn't learned about these concepts all that much. Um, they make some really important points about privilege in terms of the importance of listening you know, and not presuming you're an expert on, on someone else's experience or an expert on a kind of marginalization that you don't experience yourself. They make some good points about uh, it being incumbent on, on those of us with various forms of privilege to really educate ourselves, um, you know, and to not go bugging members of marginalized groups to like, t t you know, use their emotional energy to educate us about our ignorance. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate a lot of the points that they made there. Um, similarly, they talk um, about allyship 
and I'm glad that they, they define and they talk about allyship and its importance. There are some great tarot prompts for thinking about allyship, which I um, appreciate. Um, I would have liked, because they discuss allyship and they discuss privilege and they talk about s systemic oppression or structural oppression, I would have appreciated if that also got a definition and like a little bit more um, conversation just because I think without that explanation about structural, systemic, institutionalized oppression, conversations about oppression can become really individualized, right? And can, it can start to kind of just sound like individual acts of, you know, name calling or nastiness or dislike, um, which really don't get at the issue of systemic and um, institutional oppression. I think the authors are talking about, right, that they want to be talking about. So I just wish that that was made a little bit more explicit. Um, and then in terms of their discussion of allyship, I think it's worth mentioning that ally is not something that you just get to call yourself, you know. Um, I want to be an ally, so I'm an ally. It, it runs that risk of, um, you know, just swoop in and start fixing things for people. Um, which can actually be really, really problematic, right? They do talk a lot in the allyship section about, you know, stepping back, about listening more, about not kind of charging in and taking the lead on things. You know, so it's there, um, but I think it's worth mentioning. You know, an ally is not, uh, you know, a thing you just get to call yourself and you're an ally regardless of what other people say. <laughs> so, you know, worth mentioning. Um, so overall, in terms of the politics of the book, I will say that I really appreciate um, that in talking about, you know, quote unquote, troubled times, if you want to use that language, um, I appreciate that in the book, they're really willing to go there and talk about oppression and talk about privilege and they talk about um, accessibility and barriers to access. They talk about power, you know, and a lot of the time those things aren't talked about enough. So I really, really, you know, despite there being, I think, some issues from my perspective, I appreciate their willingness to name these things and to address them in ways that are thoughtful and to invite the reader to think about these things in their own life, um, you know, in critical, thoughtful ways. I do want to mention one issue and really, I don't even know if this discussion about the politics of the book is the place to discuss this, but it was the one piece in the book that really just um, hit me in a way that, that was not good, um, that I have a significant problem with, and I wasn't sure where else to discuss in the context of this review. Um, so this is a point that's made, um, you know, in the context of talking about what I would call shielding, uh, you know, and, and personal, um, personal boundaries, it's coming after a conversation about psychic vampires and energetic cords in the book. So it's talking about um, these kinds of um, ways to, um, you know, put, I guess, maintain personal boundaries or to, um, to shield oneself. And this is in a, in a bullet pointed uh, list right after this psychic vampire conversation in a list called parting notes. And one of the points, I'm just going to read it. This is a verbatim quotation, quote, avoid drinking, smoking, and overeating, avoid casual sexual encounters, and social interactions when you are feeling compromised. Anything that takes you out of your mind and takes you out of your spirit leaves you open. This feels really like a thou shalt not to me. Um, it feels, you know, particularly, and I'm, I'm trying my best to not take this out of context, um, but this kind of, you know, don't drink, don't smoke, don't eat too much, don't have casual sex feels um, like blame and shame. It feels sex negative um, in ways that I really don't appreciate. Um, I think that, you know, it, Things like, you know, like relationships to alcohol and relationships to, you know, one's sexuality are things that we all navigate, you know, for ourselves in all kinds of ways. And that is like, you know, that's a 50 video series at minimum to talk about all of these things. Um, but that one point just really, like amidst all of the other things around it, jumped out as this, um, 
ju- judgmental, <laughs> to say the very least. Um, and that doesn't work for me. So that was an issue that I had there. Now, <laughs> whew, and just, I could say more, but I'm not going to say more. <laughs> We'd be here a while. Okay. So I want to move on to think about the um, activities in the book. And here I'm thinking about the tarot spreads in the book, um, you know, suggestions for there's different kinds of activities there. Um, and I think that this may be because of the nature of the book itself as one focused on, um, you know, kind of self work and self exploration. I feel like the activities are maybe the thing that someone looking at this book is actually the most interested in um, or is looking for. And maybe that's something that you are the most interested in hearing my thoughts about. Um, and I will say of, of the sections of the book, I think that the activities is like a lot where the book shines for me. Um, so there are nine tarot spreads included in the book. Um, so some of them are more good for beginners because there are fewer cards. There's also some quite large spreads as well. Um, I will say in terms of the spreads of the nine spreads, three of them deal with addiction. <laughs> so that's that's very specific, um, definitely very important. Um, you know, uh, one of them I think deals with, um, you know, experiencing addiction oneself. One of them deals with experiencing relapse, um, in, you know, in the context of um, trying to mitigate addiction. And then the third kind of deals with um having a loved one who's experiencing addiction and, and trying to support that person. So these are, these are very, again, very specific uh, spreads. Just good to know. I mean, they may be something that someone is really, really um, looking for and really needs, or they may be something that a reader might not be looking for, in which case it's like, oh, but it's a third of the spreads. So it's worth mentioning. Um, one of those spreads does have a spread position that I had a bit of an issue with just personally in terms of how I read tarot, which has something to do with, um, you know, what does this other person in my life who is experiencing addiction need? Um, insofar as we think of, of tarot as kind of a mirror to our own subconscious or something like that, to our, our kind of inner knowing or, our, you know, you know, the knowledge that we're trying to unlock that we already have. I don't think me asking myself what someone else needs in general is a thing that I'm interested in doing, to be honest. Uh, so, you know, I think there's also possibilities for um, judgmental thinking to creep in with questions like that, like thinking that you know better than someone else what that other person needs. But overall, I think, you know, the, the nine spreads are um, are good. Um, you know, there's a mind, body, spirit spread. There's a what's going on and what do I do about it? Um, and then they range up to, I think, the biggest might be 12 cards and the smallest is like two. So there's a lot of range. Um, there's also a section that's nice about, uh, it's a short section about designing your own spread and just some tips. Um, I think designing a spread can feel, um, intimidating to someone who hasn't done it before to a, a newer reader. So it's helpful that, um, they talk about that. I also think that a lot of the, um, prompts in the book that are just, you know, not part of tarot spreads, but are prompts for, you know, think about this, ask yourself this question, reflect on this, um, you know, there's a second, you know, just ask yourself. And then there's a kind of list of questions. I think that a lot of those would make great positions in spreads as well. I think that there's a lot of great um, questions that would make good journaling prompts that sometimes they're labeled journaling prompts and sometimes they're just kind of there in the context of other discussions, like questions to think about uh, or questions to meditate on or, or however it's framed. But I think there's a lot of good journaling material in this book, um, which is great because I think that that actually may be what someone looking at this book is mo is interested in so that's a big a big plus um, i think um, there's a quadrant exercise um, that involves thinking about um, what we're good at what we're not good at what we enjoy what we don't enjoy and where those things intersect and i think that there's a lot of contexts where an activity like that would be really um, helpful uh, i think that activities like that are really helpful um, they also have some sections on things like um, tarot for setting intentions uh, so things that aren't doing readings, but other ways to work with a tarot deck that I think are great. Uh, lots of great ideas um, in there uh, to do. And I will say there's a lot about, um, this isn't the activities per se, but like how the authors discuss the activities that they're presenting. There is a lot about their approach that I really appreciate. So 
One thing is that they note that um, tarot and their suggestions about tarot is not a substitute for professional assistance, whether that's a, you know, a financial advisor or a counselor or a doctor. They're really, um, you know, I think we can kind of scoff at these kinds of disclaimers, but I think that when, you know, you have a book that's dealing with like some, some difficult things, th those kind of gentle nudges, you know, are really important. And in a couple of places they talk about, you know, not, um, not being ashamed to ask for help, you know, when you need help with, with various, you know, possible things. And I think that that's really supportive and I really like that um, they took that approach. They also generally, I found, were quite aware of the ways in which, uh, you know, exercises or activities um, might need to look different for different people, how different needs might mean different approaches, right? So acknowledgments of things like, um, you know, what our best posture is for meditating is, is going to really vary, right? And our, our posture and our comportment and our, our mobility, for example, is going to all come into play there. And there was, there was good, like, thoughtful acknowledgement of things like that that I really appreciated. Uh, I like a lot how they talk about affirmations. So they do include affirmations uh, in here in a couple of sections. And they have one area that's just um, kind of about how to work with affirmations. And... Do I have the wrong page number? No, I don't. 91. So um, this is with birth cards, but really you, you could work with this idea anywhere. And they talk about, you know, reading the affirmations that they've provided in the book and thinking about whether or not they actually resonate with you and, and why that might be, about reflecting on them, about writing your own affirmations, right? About um, thinking about these kind of things critically, right? Which I, I think is really... Um, good because at one point they talk about affirmations as kind of one tool in terms of um, the, to quote them they say to rewrite your internal narrative end quote uh, but they also don't shy away from talking about the ways that we can't just like rewrite our life to be whatever we want it to be right um, and that rewriting those internal internal narratives or, or disrupting you know unhelpful internal thought patterns things like this is, is going to look different for for all of us um, you know, it is not a fix-all. And I really, really appreciate that. And they note on page 201, I have some quotes that I liked from this book. Um, after they're talking about um, some different rituals and spells which they provide in the book, they wrote something that I, that I liked. <laughs> a couple of things that I liked, actually. So they say, quote, on page 201, there are also situations that cannot be easily fixed through spiritual tools. For example, a person who is living in poverty may lack access to things that could help them move out of their situation. While rituals may help create positive energy, other resources such as financial aid, job training, or assistance from relatives will do far more to alter their circumstances. And they go on a little bit later to talk about how particular um, forms of kind of law of attraction thinking can function in really victim blamey ways uh, and can function to ignore systemic inequalities in society and systemic barriers to access to resources um, that are very real and that can't be just you know meditated away because because we don't want them to be there anymore right um, and i really appreciate that acknowledgement i think that it doesn't happen often enough and so they write quote there are many situations that have nothing to do with mindset, but everything to do with things that are outside your control, end quote. And I don't think there's anything disempowering about acknowledging that. I think it's really, really important to recognize, right, that those, um, that those, that those barriers, that those inaccessibilities, that, um, that, you know, deprivation, that, yeah, systemic exclusions, like these things, these things exist, right? And they're not a matter of having a negative mindset or not attracting the right kinds of energy, right? <laughs> they're problems of systematic oppression, systemic oppression. And I really appreciate how they talk about that. So <laughs> to conclude, this is my concluding thoughts. Um, very mixed thoughts about this book. Um, you know, some things that I think are really, um, helpful, some, some um, 
things that I really appreciate about this book. And then there are, you know, I definitely, of course, inevitably have my criticisms. Um, I think that this book could be a great book for someone who is just interested in thinking about, maybe, you know, is very early on in thinking about how, um, you know, any kind of personal development work they're interested in doing might connect with broader social change making, right? And I think that that connection is an important one. And I think that often when we think about or talk about, you know, self-development or personal growth, there isn't that next um, conversation about creating change in the world, right? As it, not just creating change internally, but creating change in the world and making the world um, a better place, uh, a more equitable, equitable place, a more just place, right? Uh, I think that that conversation is really important. And if someone's interested in exploring that conversation, this book may really be of interest. Um, and there are a lot of things here in terms of the kind of political orientation of the book. Sure, I've mentioned some problems that, that I had with it, but there are a lot of things about it that, you know, they mention things that aren't mentioned enough. You know, like I was just talking about with affirmations or with, um, you know, so-called law of attraction kind of thinking. So there's like aspects of it that I really appreciate as well. Um, and I will say to conclude um, that the book, I think, does have a good wide array of activities, many of which um, I think that many readers would find useful, would find supportive, um, and would enjoy working through. So that is my review of the book. Um, Tarot for Troubled Times by Shaheen Miro and Teresa Reed. Uh, I have lots and lots of underlines <laughs> um, in this book and lots and lots of stars and margin comments. And there are definitely some um, activity ideas that I will be coming back to. Um, so I'm glad that I got to um, you know, learn about those there. Um, if you have read this book, um, do let me know your thoughts um, in the description box below or if you're interested um, in reading this book and you have any questions about what I thought about anything that I haven't mentioned. Um, I always, I was making notes um, knowing that I would read, I would, I would probably want to share some kind of review of this book. I was making tons of notes in the back, um, you know, and inevitably trying to keep this video at a somewhat reasonable length, which maybe it isn't, who knows? <laughs> um, you know, I haven't been able to discuss about everything, but yeah, so if you have any questions, let me know, um, you know, or, or share your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching, um, especially if you got to the end of this. Wow, um, this was longer than I anticipated. But, um, you know, with a book like this, there's always so much to say, right? And I think that a detailed um, discussion, um, at least for me, like can be helpful when I'm deciding if a particular book might be for me or not. I always appreciate uh, a thorough book review. So that has been my hope um, to be helpful in that way. Thanks again. Have a great day.